Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart failure, ALS, Parkinson's. What do these diseases have in common? We don't have cures for them. Correction, we don't have cures for them in people. But all these diseases have been cured in mice. Razor, Bacol, Trazolol, Resilin, Fiox. What do these drugs have in common? They've all been withdrawn from the market due to lethal consequences in humans, but they were safe and effective in mice. Ladies and gentlemen, we've all heard the glories of animal research, the discovery of insulin, penicillin, and the polio vaccine, history-altering medical breakthroughs that wouldn't have been possible without the use of animals at that time. But those tales of the glories are few and far in between. Breakthroughs in research labs don't make it into our pharmacies very often anymore, like 95% of the time. You heard me right. 95% of drugs tested and found to be safe and effective in animals fail in human clinical trials. Of the 5% that make it through, half of those are withdrawn, or so they receive black box warnings due to unpredicted side effects in humans. We have spent years and years and years doing disease research to understand the molecular basis of disease. Then from there, it takes another 10 to 15 years and costs one to two billion dollars to bring a single drug to market. This whole process relies heavily on animal data until we hit human clinical trials. It's a house of cards built on a table full of termites. This animal-centered paradigm has two main implications, the hidden threats and the missed opportunities, what I call the bad and the ugly. On the one hand, we have drugs that pass animal testing with flying colors. For example, Vioxx, an anti-inflammatory painkiller that passed animal testing with flying colors in six different species. It was safe. There were no indications of cardiovascular problems. In fact, there were several studies in mice that showed it could actually be cardioprotective. It could be beneficial to your heart. But in reality, in the United States alone, 88,000 people had heart attacks and more than 38,000 of them died. Now, what about the converse scenario? What if there were a drug that worked beautifully in humans, one that was safe during pregnancy, one that you could take one a day to keep heart attacks away? But what if this drug caused birth defects in mice, rats, guinea pigs, rabbits, cats, dogs, sheep, and monkeys? Then this drug would never be approved for your use. And right here, I'm not talking about a hypothetical drug, I'm talking about aspirin, something that's probably in all of your medicine cabinets, a life-saving drug. So how many other life-saving, history-altering medications have we missed out on? We don't know the answer to that because they never came to market. Why is animal research such a failure-prone endeavor? Now, I'm gonna need the rest of the afternoon to answer that question, but I can give you a glimpse into this world from fruit flies to primates and everyone in between, we use animals to emulate our diseases and our drug responses. Mice and rats serve as the gold standard and they account for more than 90% of animals used in biomedical research, not least because they emulate our biology the best, but mostly because it's convenient. They're cheap, they're easy to manipulate, they have short lifespans, and there's decades of historical data. The real problem is, all these species are separated by crucial genetic, biochemical, physiological factors that were brought upon by hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And these factors are further confounded by things such as age and sex variability and the way we experimentally induce diseases in these animals and even the way we house and breed these animals. Most of our controlled animals are not even appropriate controls. They're sick before we even make them sick. So all of these factors can mislead entire fields into wasting decades of time and billions of dollars. Let's consider one example, Alzheimer's disease. Did you know that it's been 100 years since Dr. Alzheimer first described the disease named after him? We've spent an enormous amount of time and energy studying Alzheimer's disease, and we've managed to cure it in mice. But in humans, we don't even understand the molecular basis of this disease. Over 400 human clinical trials have failed. That's a 99.6% failure rate. So what do our frustrated scientists want to do? They want to create better animal models. This is not just in Alzheimer's, but this holds true for pretty much every disease prevalent in our society today. 
we have a scientific culture ingrained in animal research, a culture obsessed with curing animals, a culture that often forgets we are trying to cure humans. So what's happening while we strive to create better animal models? Every seven minutes, a Canadian dies of a heart attack. Every nine minutes, a Canadian dies of a stroke. We don't have cures. Every three minutes, a Canadian is diagnosed with diabetes. Almost a century after the discovery of insulin in Toronto, we don't have a cure for diabetes. 40% of Canadians will get cancer in their lifetime. There are no cures for cancer, for most cancers today, and there's nothing on the horizon. We can continue down this path for another century and not make major progress if we continue this same way. It is undeniable that animals have contributed immensely to our understanding of disease and biology in general, and they have even led to some medical discoveries and advancements. We always glorify those limited successes and sweep the colossal failures under the rug. In the second decade of the 21st century, it's paradoxical that we know more about animal biology than our own biology. If the ultimate goal of the scientific community is to advance human medicine, it's time to prioritize human biology. It's time to think beyond animal testing. It's time to usher in a new era of research and innovation. It's time to make humans the quintessential animal model. It's time to make our biology the gold standard. So how do we do this, scientifically and ethically? Again, I'm going to need the rest of the afternoon to talk about that, but I will give you a glimpse into this world. Since the human genome was mapped 16 years ago, we have a tremendous amount of information and tools at our disposal to look at human biology in a completely different light. We can use cells and tissues from cadavers and from surgical remains, we can engineer cells. We can take a teeny little biopsy of your skin and generate adult stem cells and convert those cells, reprogram those cells to become any cell type in your body. And you can take these cells and engineer them to become more complex structures, little organs that we call organoids, or 3D bioprint them so they mimic the tissues in our body more accurately. And you can take these cells, these organoids, these tissues and organs, and configure them in so many different ways to create disease in a dish. Or you can put them on a computer chip the size of a thumb drive and do drug testing on it, test hundreds of drugs at once. These micro-engineered environments emulate our natural physiology. We can use non-invasive imaging and population studies epidemiological data that we've relied on for hundreds of years. And we can use computational modeling. Artificial intelligence and supercomputers are giving us the ability to model human biology to an unprecedented level of detail and simulate biological scenarios that would never be possible in a living organism. So how are we doing with this? Here's a glimpse into this world. We're already getting more insight into Alzheimer's disease in humans simply by looking at the brains of patients who died of Alzheimer's disease. And we can take stem cells from these patients and grow brain cells, cells that carry the disease within them. Or we can assemble them into more complex structures that we call mini brains. It's like taking a little part of a brain, but it's recreated in a dish. It has all the different cellular interactions and the physiology and the biochemistry. And my colleague, Dr. Thomas Hartung at Johns Hopkins University is already creating Parkinson's in a dish. He's creating autism in a dish. We're replacing animal testing one by one. Instead of using mice for allergy testing, you can use human cells. Instead of using rabbits for skin irritation, you can use engineered synthetic human skin. Instead of forcing dogs to inhale toxic chemicals, we can use human lung epithelial cells or lung on a chip. And computer programs are already beating. Animal tests is predicting our biology, our drug responses. This is 21st century science and innovation. Do we have every single thing we need today to replace animal testing altogether? No, we don't, but we certainly need to move in that direction toward ultimate replacement. Slowly but surely, the world is moving in this direction. From the Americas to the Far East, 
Many countries across the globe have already established national centers dedicated to the development and validation of alternative methods, and they've approved legislation and developed strategic roadmaps to shift away from animal testing. And right here at the University of Windsor, we established Canada's first and only center of its kind, the Canadian Center for Alternatives to Animal Methods and the affiliated Canadian Center for the Validation of Alternative Methods. The overarching vision of our center, something that I developed from the back of a napkin to reality, the overarching goal is to promote the replacement of animals in Canadian biomedical research, education, and regulatory testing through 21st century science, innovation, and ethics. Through our newly established Eric S. Margulis Research and Training Laboratory for Alternative to Animal Methods, we're doing disease research. We're looking at human disease using human cells and tissues. We're creating diabetes in a dish and Alzheimer's in a dish. And we're developing academic programs to train the next generation of scientists, ethicists, policymakers, and regulators to think outside the cage. And through our validation center, we're working with Health Canada and our international partners to modernize toxicology and chemical safety testing. We're joining the global efforts in a uniquely Canadian way. Animal testing is not only scientifically flawed, but it's riddled with ethical concerns as well. As scientists, we have a scientific and an ethical obligation to adhere to the highest ethical standards. Animals are not merely tools in science. They're not cells on a petri dish. They're living, breathing, sentient beings who feel pain. Beings who, if they had the choice, would never consent to experimentation. As a former animal researcher, I experienced firsthand that when it comes to feeling pain, these animals in labs are not different from the cats that I absolutely cherish and adore and respect at home. The time has come for the scientific community to uphold the highest scientific and ethical standards to reduce the use of animals as much as possible and to replace the use of animals whenever, wherever, and anywhere possible. In the same way we look at gladiator fights and slavery today, future generations will read about our animal research labs with a mix of incredulity and contempt. It's time to show them that we took the right steps in history to shift away from a failing animal-centered paradigm to one that's scientifically viable and ethically justifiable. If we were to discover insulin, penicillin, and the polio vaccine today, we can do that without using animals. Imagine for a moment in the not too distant future you walk into your doctor's office, and the doctor takes a teeny little skin biopsy off of you, sends it off to the lab, and they derive adult stem cells from this little sample, and they reprogram these to become every cell type in your body. And they take these cells and bioprint them into teeny little tissues and organs, take these tissues and organs and put them on a custom organs on a chip platform and test hundreds of drugs on it to find the one that's most appropriate for you based on your cells, your tissues, and your biology, not mouse biology. This is what we owe to the next generation. This is what we owe to the generations past, the generations that never got the cures they deserve to get. It's time to pave the way for the future generations to have access to safe and effective medicines and the platforms to do biomedical research and chemical safety testing that meet the highest ethical standards. Every Canadian now has the power and the opportunity to contribute to that legacy. Thank you very much. <laughs>